But um, looking at this from a broader perspective also, I'm really happy to have David Held here over video. Um, David Held is, uh, you know, for those of you who have read his books and, and been a leading thinker in terms of how do we, how, both in terms of where can we go with the global governance system, but also why aren't we doing more? And I'm happy to introduce David here as, as talking more about the fact that we have a situation where we re need really strong global action, but at the same time we seem to do even less. So without further ado, David Held, over to you, and I'll click your slides. Can you see me? Yes. Well, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I, uh, can you hear me well enough? So, so, a little bit closer. Well, I, I'm, I'm quite close to the microphone. I just, I just want to make sure you can hear me properly. I can't hear you completely, so that's, uh, we may have a sound problem. Can you hear me? All right. Well, ask, let me just give you the introduction, and you can tell me if you can hear me properly. I, I just want to, first of all, apologize for not being with you today. It's the start of the new academic year here, and we are surrounded by thousands of new students. That's why I have to speak to you today on Skype. The second thing is, of course, it's a strange experience for me to speak with you on Skype, even stranger for you probably, uh, over this, and I apologize for any awkwardness. And thirdly, if you have a chance later, Google images of Durham Castle, and you'll see where I am. It's an absolutely magnificent castle and a very exceptional one because it is used every day as part of the University of Durham. Now, did you hear that? Yes. Did, did you hear that? <laughs> is that a yes? Yes! <laughs> good, very good. So let me go on now. My talk in the next 12 minutes or so is on the theme of global risks, gridlock, and a global governance. And I basically want to argue to you that what the mechanisms, the institutional mechanisms that created the success of the post-war period, post-war prosperity, economic growth, the integration of the world economy, the rise of Asia, and so on, the conditions which created that success have now created such success that they've created unintended consequences which are stripped the capacity of existing institutions to manage contemporary global challenges. That is basically the argument. Here come some examples, then the detail, and then a conclusion. Are there pathways out of gridlock? So let me start. The Delaware trade uh, negotiations are deadlocked. Despite eight successful previous multilateral trade rounds, climate negotiations have been going on for two decades without finding a way to stem global emissions. Global emissions, as you know, are steadily rising and will continue to rise as far as we can project it. The UN is increasingly paralyzed in the face of growing insecurities across the world, Syria being the latest dramatic example uh, despite the recent developments on chemical weapons on the ground, that doesn't make much difference. Each of these phenomena could be treated as if they were independent and an explanation sought for their peculiarity. Indeed, I've gone to many lectures on why Copenhagen failed, uh, why uh, 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 the Doval trade round has failed, and so on. But what strikes me is not their particularities, but what strikes me is what they have in common. And that is what I'm concerned about now. I want to suggest to you that global cooperation is gridlocked across a range of areas. The reasons for this are not the result of any single underlying causal structure, but rather of several underlying dynamics that work together. Global cooperation today is failing because, not simply rather, not simply because there are many difficult problems to solve, and they are, and they are difficult, and they are very hard to solve, but also because of the unintended consequences of previous phases of huge, colossal, post-war prosperity and success. Are you with me so far? Yes. You can, you can hear me all right? Yes. Good. I'll move on then. Like to understand concept. why gridlock has come about, it is important to understand how it is that the post-Second World War era facilitated 
in many respects, a successful form of governed globalization that contributed to the relative peace and prosperity that we've seen across the world over several decades. The period since 1945 was marked by peace between the great powers, although, of course, there were many proxy wars fought out in the global south. This relative, note, relative stability created the conditions for what can now be regarded as an unprecedented period of prosperity that characterized the 1950s onwards. Although it is, of course, by no means the sole cause, the UN system is central to this story, helping to create the conditions under which decolonization and successive waves of democratization could take root, profoundly altering world politics. While the economic record of the post-war years varies by country, of course, many experienced significant economic growth and living standards rose rapidly across significant parts of the world. By the late 1980s, a variety of East Asian countries were beginning to grow at unprecedented speeds, and by, of course, by the late 1990s, countries such as India, China, and Brazil had gained significant economic momentum, a process that continues to this day. I have been a regular visitor to China, India, uh, uh, Vietnam, and elsewhere for over 25 years, and have seen, of course, how these countries are transformed. Post-war institutions, I want to suggest to you, created conditions under which a multitude of actors could benefit from establishing companies, multinational companies, investing abroad, developing global production chains, and engaging with a plethora of social and economic processes associated with globalization. These conditions, combined with the expansionary logic of capitalism and basic technological innovation, changed the nature of the world economy, radically increased dependence on people and countries from every corner of the world. This complex interdependence, in turn, created a demand for further institutions, which states, seeking to ensure the benefits of cooperation, began to provide anew. So you've got, and this is my second figure, really, a cycle of self-reinforcing interdependence. And that's the second figure, really. Or should be the second, maybe it's the third figure. This is not to say that international institutions were the only cause of the dynamic form of globalization experienced over the last few decades. Changes in the nature of global capitalism, breakthroughs in transportation and information technology are obviously critical drivers of interdependence. However, all of these changes, and here's the argument, were allowed to thrive, could thrive, could develop, because they took place in a relatively open, relatively peaceful, relatively liberal, relatively institutionalized world order. By preventing World War III and the conditions of another Great Depression, even including 2007-8, the multilateral order arguably did more for interdependence, or as much for interdependence at least, as microprocessors or email. So that's the suggestion that the multilateral order did as much for interdependence in the post-war years as microprocessors or email. This is what I call a period of self-reinforcing interdependence. But I now want to suggest that it's progressed to the point where it's altered our ability to engage in further global cooperation. That is, economic and political shifts internal to this story, attributable to the success of the post-war period, are now amongst the factors grinding the system into gridlock. And I want to suggest, and we can have now the, the, the image of four pathways to gridlock, I want to suggest to you there are four reasons for this blockage, four pathways to gridlock, rising multipolarity, institutional inertia, complex harder problem, and institutional fragmentation. Each pathway is a separate causal pathway and can be thought of as a growing trend that embodies a specific mix of causal mechanisms. However, gridlock at the global level often comprises a mixture. Although each one would be enough, they often comprise a mixture. Now, let me explain each of these mechanisms in turn. And you will see that each one in sentence is itself a, pro a product of the success of the post-war period, but has now become a question mark or a problem. Let's start with growing multipolarity. <laughs> 
the absolute number of the states has increased by 300% in the last 70 years, meaning that the most basic transaction costs of global governance have grown. More importantly, and this is much more important, the number of states that matter on a given issue, let me emphasize that, the number of states that matter on a given issue, that is, states without whose cooperation the global problem cannot adequately be addressed, has expanded by similar proportion. So to solve a problem today, we need more states collaborating with each other than ever before. At Bretton Woods, let me give you an example. In 1945, the rules of the economy could essentially be written by the United States with consultation with the UK and other European allies. In the aftermath of the 2008-09 crisis, the G20 has become the principal forum for global economic management such that it is, not because the established post-war victors desired to be more inclusive, but because they could not solve the problems on their own. However, a consequence of this progress is that many more countries, representing a diverse range of interests, must agree in order for global cooperation to occur. And that is very hard. Anyone at Copenhagen, for example, will know how hard it is to get a large number of countries with a diverse range of interests agreeing to produce an outcome called global cooperation. It's extremely difficult. On top of this comes something else called institutional inertia, the second pathway. The post-war order succeeded in part because it incentivized the great powers to stay in the key institutions. It embedded their privileges. From the UN Security Council to the Bretton Woods institutions, to the non-proliferation treaty, key pillars of the global order explicitly grant special privileges to the countries that were wealthy and powerful at the time of their creation. In other words, the architects embedded their privileges into those institutions, hardly a surprise. This hierarchy, I think, was probably necessary to secure the participation of the most important and largest countries in the post-war order in order to avoid again another League of Nations. Today, however, the gains from this trade-off have shrunk while the costs have grown. As power shifts from west to east, north to south, a broader range of participation is needed on nearly all global issues if they're to be adequately dealt with. At the same time, following decolonization, the end of the Cold War, and economic development, the idea that some countries should hold more rights and privileges than others is increasingly and rightly regarded as morally bankrupt. And yet, the architects of the post-war order did not, in most cases, design institutions that would organically adjust to the fluctuations of national power, and it's very hard to change them. Thirdly, harder problems, the problems have become a lot tougher to solve. As interdependence across the world has deepened, the types and scopes of problems around which countries must cooperate has evolved. Problems are now both more extensive, implicating a broader range of countries and individuals within countries, and they're also more intensive. Do you want me to start? Oh. Penetrating more deeply into domestic policy space and daily life. Consider, for example, trade. For much of the post-war era, trade negotiations focused on reducing tariff levels on manufactured products traded between industrial countries. Now, however, negotiating a trade agreement requires discussing a host of social, environmental, cultural subjects such as MGOs, intellectual property rights, health and environmental standards, biodiverse late standards, about which countries often sharply disagree. Let me give you an example. In the area of environmental change, a similar set of considerations applies. The clean-up and industrial smog, or address ozone depletion, required a fairly number, a fairly set of discrete actions from a limited number of top pollutants. By contrast, the threat of climate change and the efforts to mitigate it involve nearly all countries of the world. Yet the divergence of voice and interest within both the developed and developing world, along with the sheer complexity of these issues, means the global deal is thus far impossible. 
Well, given the time constraints on me, I'm going to skip fragmentation, but at least I think you can begin to see the argument that the success of the post-war era nurtured a shift from uni and bipolarity to multipolarity. It made the world much more complex and interdependent. The issues that countries had to agree upon escalated in complexity, taking them often to the heart of domestic value and policy agendas. At the same time, institutions didn't change because they were had in them the embedded interests of the post-war victors. Let me just simply move now from elaborating this further, and I've just published a very substantial book on this. If anybody is interested, they should look at it. Let me just, in the last two or three minutes, ask the following questions. Are there ways of moving beyond this gridlock? I want to suggest that there are a number of forces at play, but each one of which is weak. These include potentials, of course, of social movements to up existing political constraints, catalyzed by the IT innovation and the use of associated technology for the coordination across borders. Or we can think of the capacity of existing institutions to adapt and accommodate factors such as emerging multipolarity. For example, the shift from the G5, 7 to the G20 is an example. And we can also see efforts or attempts to reform institutions at a more fundamental level. But none of these have gone very far. Social movements find it difficult to convert protests to consolidated institutional change. At the same time, the political leadership of the great power blocks appeared dogged by national concerns. Washington itself is divided. Europe is preoccupied by the euro, and China is absorbed by sustaining its own legitimacy through economic growth. Against this background, the further deepening of gridlock and the continuing failure to address collective action problems appears to me more likely rather than less likely. Let me conclude. In the aftermath of the Second World War, the institutional breakthroughs that occurred provided the momentum for decades of sustained economic growth, geopolitical stability, sufficient for the transformation of the world economy, the shift from the Cold War to a multipolar order, and the rise of a new communication network societies. However, what worked then does not work now, as gridlock freezes problem-solving capacities, so the search for new politics and a new way of thinking about politics beyond gridlock becomes a very urgent task. And I would simply say that the kind of work represented by the multi-stakeholder approach, example now being developed in global risk and opportunity indicators, seems to me a very good example of thinking about how we can move beyond this. And this work is supported by the Global Challenges Foundation, some of you might know about, which I also think is putting an emphasis in the right place. But to shift our institutions that were once successful to a new developmental path is, as I suggest, an immensely difficult task. And therefore, I think I've come to the end of my time, and I need to hand over, I gather, to Peter Bakker from the World Business, of Council, Business Council for Sustainable Development. So is that correct? That's very, that's very correct. Thank you, David. Um, and... I think this is also a good sober view that some of the structures we have around us right now is not really moving in the right direction. We have sometimes a tendency to hope that everything is moving in the right direction, but some things are also very difficult. We need to address that and see how we can turn that into opportunities and maybe think beyond what they were saying, you know, these incremental improvements, and really start and think about new approaches. And this is very much, of course, what the Foundation is all about. But um, I'll hand over to Margot, who's uh, now going to introduce the next speaker.